Welcome back, gang. It's Deltia from DeltiasGaming.com, and a lot has changed for the Elder Scrolls Online in 2022 in the previous year. I'm going to catch you up to speed in a quick, easy-to-consume video. You're going to want to watch this to know about hybrid changes, weapon choices, gear, armor, passives, and everything so you can take this information and assemble your build properly for the current meta in 2022 and beyond. Let's get started. First major change that sets the stage for majority of what I'm going to talk about is the hybridization change, and this happened back in March of this year, Ascended Tides DLC Update 33. Essentially, they changed the way the abilities scale and effectiveness based off of your highest offensive stats. Now, I've done a ton of different videos to kind of explain this, but I'll go Deltia level, Barney level. Let's take a Stamina Nightblade, for instance, okay? Previously to this, if you casted a magic-based ability, it wouldn't do very much, specifically healing or damage. Because the computer of the game would look at what's your max magic pool, what's your spell damage, and then go, eh, it's not going to be that effective. So you didn't really have a whole lot of use for your off stat. Now that's not the case. What the game does is dynamically look at what's the highest. So going back to that Stamina Nightblade example, and specifically a skill Twisting Path, a typically Magic Nightblades would use hits extremely hard on Magic Nightblades. Well, now it does on Stamina Nightblades as well. And this can be applied to pretty much any class, whether you're magic or stamina. Meaning, your off stat becomes just as important as your main stat, as long as you're focusing on one. So you're still going to stack either weapon or spell damage, and you're still going to stack either max magic or stamina. It just means the off stat is very, very, very strong to dip into. Let me continue to explain this point. So what this does is essentially opens up magic classes to get access to super hard hitting dots that were relegated to stamina builds, like Razor Caltrops from the Alliance War or Stampede from Two-Hander. It allows stamina builds to get access to really hard hitting damage over time, but also healing, which affects PvP dramatically. And it also helps you sustaining your abilities because now you can dip into your off stat for buffs, healing, damage over times, and everything else. You kind of end up with this hybrid setup where four skills are stamina, maybe two or three are magicka, and so on. And sure, you can stick with the traditional all magic skills or all stamina skills, but you're going to be losing out in a lot of efficiency because this is just how the game is gone with the hybridizations. And it leads us to the current state of the game, and that is hybrid builds. Pretty much everyone, regardless of the class, kind of runs the same type of build. And this isn't a video debating if that's good or healthy for the game. So leave me a nasty comment or put it on Zenimax Online's channel. But in seriousness, this is what you kind of lead to in PvE and also PvP. Now this leads to weapon choices and following along the hybrid, basically everyone playing the same type of build, you're going to see most people predominantly run dual wield in PvE. Why? This typically scales the best and produces the most damage, mainly because of a passive called Twin blade and blunt which is very unique giving you critical chance for using daggers so using two daggers with different traits on it produces a lot of raw damage you'll see most builds in pve running this because of twin blade and blunt and just how well it scales now extremely important change that's relevant to critical chance and critical damage is now there's a critical damage cap which was implemented in november of 2021 this cap is a hard cap at 125 percent so you can go beyond it but you're going to get no benefit. You can find out this information on your individual character by going to your advanced stats tab. You're going to see a number there and you're going to get a base percentage of 50%. So you're going to want to leave room for aggressive Warhorn. You're going to make, make sure you're fully buffed. The best way I do this is I get my champion points slotted. I go to a 21 million parse dummy, which is going to give you all the buffs you typically would see in a trial. I get fully buffed up and I check what that number is. And I make sure that I'm just right about at that number or a little bit below Otherwise, I'm spilling over and I'm wasting effectiveness and I'm wasting stats. So you can see where this is going. Now you're running a hybrid build right around 60% critical chance or so, right around the critical damage cap of 125%. And then you can run either damage amplifying sets like bosses, which gives you raw damage for lower resources. Same with Coral Riptide. Or you can run a bunch of different proc sets and you have a couple different options. And that's the way the game's going in terms of gear skills. So I hope this is making sense. Duel gives you the best stat perks. That way you can diversify your overall stat and not exceed the critical damage, pumping out the most raw damage. Sticking to the hybridization change, you'll have two-handed back bar. And yes, even on magic builds. Well, why? One, you can diversify your stat pool so it's easier to sustain on your primary stat 
But overall, the most damage producing combo as of the making this video is VMA Perfected 2H Sword on the back bar, a skill like Stampede from the two-hander, and also an infused trait with the Berserker or weapon damage slash spell damage enchant. Realize when you use Stampede, it's going to do a lot of things for you with this combination. It's going to hit very hard. It's going to do really good single target damage over time and big AoE. That infuse with the, the Berserker enchant, when you swap to your front bar, it's still going to reprogram this weapon and spell damage enchant assuming it's still ticking and doing damage thus you can get a lot more weapon and spell damage when you're fully buffed if you maintain this ability and the ground based aoe it provides so yeah you can still stick with the destruction staff fire on the back bar and that does just fine it's not that far behind stampede but even on a magic build it seems incredibly goofy running stampede but there's a lot of benefit to it also it saves you a little bit on your resource sustain so making it easier to sustain magic so if you see pretty much every build running do wield on the front, 2H on the back with very similar skills, this is the reason why no one's telling you about it. Now you might be skeptical of running do wield in actual content, but the way the game is shaping out, everyone's playing in melee range anyways. There's really no advantage to running a fire staff or an advantage to running a bow because you're not gonna be clear back on your own doing your own thing. The best way to explain this in the serious content is the group is kind of in the shape of a diamond. You have the tank on the furthest end and the tank is gonna turn the boss that way it's behind is facing you that way you're getting the backstabber uh champion point pass if you're doing the most damage from the back or the flank you're gonna have the dps kind of stack somewhat closer right behind the boss and further behind the dps are going to be the healers the healers are going to be applying a bunch of different buffs to amplify the damage of the dps and if everyone is in this somewhat semi-close stack right around 12 meters all the different gear sets abilities will scale up and ramp up your damage so significantly so it seems weird playing a magic sorcerer with duel but in actual content or even on a parse dummy there's a reason why most people are playing in melee anyways. And if you're running a trial and you have one melee build, well, you have to stack on top of the boss anyways. And this is how all the encounters are designed. Dungeons and arenas, you might go a little bit more with range and it's sometimes easier specifically with solo arenas. But the hardcore end game players, this is what you're leaning to and this is what you should strive for if that's your goal. Another change that's relevant is back in 2021, the armor bonuses changed as well. And it's really relevant to this video because very few people understand them and or how to make them useful on your character. Medium armor passive. There's some two juicy passives in here. So medium armor users, Get the agility passive, which increases your weapon and spell damage by 2% for each medium armor piece worn. Along with dexterity passive, increasing your critical damage and healing done by 2% for every piece of medium armor equipped. But remember what I said about critical damage cap being 125%? Well, so how does that stacking as much critical damage as possible outside of PvP benefit you? It doesn't, and that's why you want to diversify your armor choices. Now, let's take that same thought process and apply it to light armor. Prodigy passive increases your weapon and spell critical rating by 219 for each piece of light armor equipped. Concentration increases your physical and spell penetration by 939 for each piece of light armor worn. So you're running daggers as a medium armor user, but you don't have any penetration. So you're going to use a couple of light if you can sustain, which is also going to help you sustain your magic cost abilities, making your build a very, very effective to use. Because now you can sustain some of those magic abilities you're casting, you're dipping into penetration to optimize your overall damage. Because if you don't know, ESO mobs typically have 18,200 resistances. So the current meta, playing a hybrid medium armor build, a lot of the tanks are going to spec gear and skills to reduce that armor to almost nothing and ramp up the overall damage of you and your group. And that's what you're seeing with tanks running a combination of Tremor Scale Monster Helm, Crimson Oath for a five piece, and also the Pierced Armor Scale to reduce the armor to next to nothing. Just so you're aware, now this goes online. In PvE, there's no point in going over that 18,200 resistance cap. There's no such thing as over pen. PvP, it's different. There's people that can walk around with 30 to 40,000 resistances, so stacking as much is usually beneficial. And that leads you to the conclusion here is that me Medium armor users can throw on one or two pieces of light with all the juicy benefits without hampering their build, while light armors can throw on one or two medium and get the crit damage, which is really lacking in their builds. So you're seeing this conclusion where you're really getting a blurred line between stamina and magic, and at the top end, you're not really seeing a difference between them. 
and you're not really seeing a huge difference in between the classes. With a lot of spammable options that have changed, you're seeing a lot of stamina leaning, stamina stacking classes using three abilities that are magic and really dominating with that stamina leaning hybrid approach, running duel on the front, stampede on the back. This is not a video to say that's good or bad. This is just the reality of ESO in 2022. Now let's switch gears and talk about gear. See what I did there? So you might be familiar with the previous meta or you might not. And I'm going to show you a bunch of different gear charts from my website, which are going to outline uh, various different gear loadouts, previous meta and current. So number one, here's what you would see in a typical um, solo build. You'd see a five piece on the body at all times trial setup, typically vicious serpent. You could, you know, apply that to basically any set. You'd have something on the body, five piece at all time. And then you'd have something on the jewelry and the weapons, which would be a proc set or something else like cameras or some a stacking of damage set that would be only be active on that bar that you are currently on your primary damage bar. Then you'd have something else being activated on the back, which is typically an arena weapon like VMA. And then you'd have a monster helm or a mythic or a mythic in a one piece to reduce a little bit of armor like crags there. And this would be your common setup that you would typically use. This setup, regardless of the items and sets that I'm showing you here, is still very, very effective, so don't be afraid to use it. Now, if you want a parse setup, here is typically something that I could be running on my website. You would run uh, Arms of Reliquin on the body at all times, assuming you're a medium armor build, and then you'd run something else like a damage amp setup or a Kinraz to maintain your stacks, assuming you're good with light attack weaving, and then you'd run good old Harpooner's Kilt with the one-piece slime crawl and a 2H on the back bar VMA, which we've already talked about. And we have the new play style which this gear set and gear chart replicates pretty much how my PvP builds are. So you're gonna have a back bar proc set. It's gonna be activated on damage and you're actually gonna drop the VMA arena weapon. And then on the front bar, you're gonna have something activated, which is also another proc set. And it's only gonna be active on your front bar. And you're gonna have a monster and a mythic. With this loadout and content, it absolutely destroys almost anything. The issue with it is you're not gonna parse very high, but with actual content, the amount of AOE and single target damage you can do, running these all these proc sets and squeaking out a mythic, what I usually do in PVP, is absolutely mind blowing. So consider this the new meta loadout if you wanna try it. And here's the uh, image of it. So I go with Pillars of Nurn in the back bar, consider Pillars of Nurn one of the strongest uh, sets in the game. And it should remain, hopefully, unless they need to watch this video nerf it for a very long time in the future coming from Falkreath Hold. Then you have World of Depths, one of the proc sets from the new Dreadcell um, Reef trial. This is also very strong up there with Pillars of Nurn. And you have your monster set of choice. You can go with Kelnars, Narayaneth, Stormfest, the list goes on and on. And then you have a mythic choice. You can go with Harpooner's Kill, Sea Serpent's Coil, Death Dealer's Fate, whatever you want. But you're getting the most efficiency out of the build, running this double proc set with the Monster Helm and a mythic. Now you look at the weapon traits, and the weapon traits pretty much stay consistent. Divine's on the body, Nurn or Precise in the main hand with Charge in the offhand, running dual wield. Two enchants, Fire and Poison along with infused weapon damage on the back or berserker as we like to call it with bloodthirsty on the jewelry and weapon or spell damage all across the board. Keep in mind bloodthirsty is great with trials but not so good with dungeons or solo contents. You might see a little bit more advantage with infuse if the bosses die quickly but when in doubt bloodthirsty is the way to go. And then you'll see the medium armor is five pieces and I have two light. That usually is the best benefit for me. Give me the most sustain so I can lean on three or four magic abilities for overall Damn. Last up I'm going to get to is ultimates of choice. Now there's two ultimates that pretty much everyone uses on almost every build and really no one explains why and I constantly get asked the question. Number one in the front bar is going to be Flawless Dawnbreaker and on number two is the back bar Shooting Star. So let me dive into this and explain exactly why people are using this. So number one is the Fighter's Guild ability on the front bar. It does a lot for you Flawless Dawnbreaker. Merely slotting it gives you increased weapon and spell damage via the Slayer passive. And when you kill a mob, Banish the Wicked gives you three ultimate. So typically I front bar this and only activate it in a dungeon and trial when the boss is very, very mobile or I don't have enough time to cast my back bar ultimate before it dies. Now you have some other options on the front bar you can slot depending on your class, but this is a go-to staple if you have no idea and no direction of what you want to do. So it really benefits you to level Fighter's Guild. On the back bar, we have Mage's Guild Shooting Star, one of the best overall pound for pound on a parse or if the mob or boss does not move. So the reasoning how you use this is you save up ultimates in between trash bowls and you start off the fight with this. There's a delay 
day before it hits so you can charge up a fully charged heavy attack cast it with all of your buffs up and get a huge spike in damage before you start and then you fully charge hit it bang the meteor lands at the same time and you're good to go and if there's a bunch of trash mobs around you're gonna need ultimate back for everyone it hits thus feeding you more ultimate getting the ultimate back faster and if you switch to the front bar something you kill dies then you get three more ultimate with banish the wicked so this is a great combination if you don't know where to start or what's really optimal for you and your class i would say check my website for individual customized builds like for instance incapacitating strikes or soul harvest on the front bar for a night blade is a great option Back bar choices, you got Standard of Might for Dragonite and Greater Storm Matronach for the Sorcerer. But these two ultimates is usually what I go to on my builds if I don't know a direction or I want to stick to something. So consider that as a returning player. And that's what you get currently. You have a hybrid focused meta that's shifted to more or less a blend of magic and stamina leaning on one stat predominantly. You can still play the old school meta. You can still play Fire Staff on the front with another Fire Staff on the back. But if you see people running these setups, this is what they're not telling you the reason why. So if you want to strive to do the most damage, this is the way you would strive for, especially the gear charts and the gear loadouts, whether you're PvE or PvP, running a double proc set, a monster and a mythic gives you the most efficiency possible in the current outline of ESO's gear. Well, let me summarize real quick in case 99% of you stopped watching this video because I begged you to do it on Twitch. Number one, hybrid changes mean your off stat is just as effective as your main stat. Number two, you'll still need to stack or max out one stat, weapon or spell damage, magic or stamina. Number three, there's a critical damage cap of 125%. Look at your character sheet and add 50% to the number and make sure you don't go over. Number Number four, dual wield currently provides the most benefit for builds with a twin blade and blunt passive with 2H on the back bar being a great option. Number five, armor changes give you flexibility, but try diversifying into two or more armors to max out stats. Number six, look at my gear charts and check the website. The old meta gear setups still work, but the PvP-ish loadout is very strong in content. Number seven, stick to some basic ultimate choices and play around with your in-class ultimates, but Dawnbreaker on the front, Shooting Star on the back are staples currently. Number eight, hit that like if you got something out of this video. Number nine, subscribe to me if you want more. And number 10, watch me on twitch.tv slash is gaming i'm amazing and this is my narcissistic self-promotion plug in all seriousness if you want to interact with me and ask me some questions it's better to come to twitch.tv slash is gaming hope you got something out of this welcome back to elder scrolls online i'll continue to make some videos and some guides and some builds to keep you players happy thanks for watching